Hey there guys, Mike here from Sell Your Service and welcome to a very special episode of our Sell Your Service Masterminds. Today we're going to be talking to Daniel Priestley. Daniel Priestley uh, is an author, he's a speaker, he's a coach, uh, you know, CEO, <clears throat> spent a lot of money, uh, made a big impact in the world of entrepreneurs. He's the author of 27, uh, 24 Assets, The Entrepreneur's Revolution, Key Person of Influence and Oversubscribed, all of which I've consumed multiple times. The best thing is he's a super cool guy to talk to. I could have talk, talked to him for ages. What we're going to be talking about today is essentially positioning yourself even as a funnel builder, as a key person of influence and authority, an expert within your space. Start charging higher prices. Start having customers approach you. Check this out. He's uh, yeah, very, very um, insightful and verbose with what he talks about. So I'm just going to let him get on with it. Thanks, guys. Hey there guys, Mike here, and I'm extremely happy to be joined by Daniel Priestley. Daniel, how are you doing? Very well. Thanks for having me on the uh, podcast. Not at all. Thanks for, thanks for coming on board. First of all, 12 years in the UK today, is that right? Something like that, yeah. I arrived with a suitcase and a credit card in London. <laughs> I remember it being very hot, and if memory serves, it was the 6th of June. So, wow. um, yeah. So That's it's, insane. Uh, yeah, I was only here for two years, apparently. Yeah, exactly. That was the plan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that, I hear that a lot. Um, so for those who don't know, the, the few people who don't know what it is that you do and, and you know, what you're working on, who is Daniel Priestley and what does he do? Yeah, so um, I'm, I'm well known as an author. Uh, from I wrote a series of books, the Entrepreneur Journey series, which takes people through starting a business, um, becoming a key person of influence, running successful campaigns and promotions, and then scaling through digital assets. Um, and what I do day to day is I run a business accelerator program, which is a lot of training and development for entrepreneurs. Uh, we run that in seven cities around the world. Um, we're a group of companies as well, including media and publishing, um, and it services. And, um, uh, we, we have, uh, some of the world's most celebrated leaders and mentors in the entrepreneurial space who come in and mentor and train, uh, our entrepreneurs who are selected to go on the programs. And then that typically works on the transfers into implementation projects that could be around funding or developing technology. Yeah, and this is this is a key um, message that comes across in all of your books and a lot of your content is about scaling out one leader's impact on the world and getting them to do more and what their mission is. And, and I think you refer to it as their big game and key person of influence and scaling that out. And that's kind of been a lot of what you've been talking about recently as well, particularly with some of your books. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, for me, I have a really big game that entrepreneurial uh, minds should be focused on the world's most meaningful problems. Um, nothing makes me more frustrated than seeing brilliant minds solving really dull problems <laughs> like, you know, stupid games on people's phones or, yeah. um, or, you know, how to optimize a click onto an ad. I really want to get, the world's most brilliant entrepreneurial minds thinking about how do we solve the big problems in the world. And there's almost a, a, a moral obligation thread running through a lot of your um, advice like that, that actually when you connect with something that does really solve a big problem and really make people's lives better, it's actually easier for the entrepreneur and the leader to, to continue working on their business when they have this kind of, you know, like moral obligation to, to, to move forward and, and, help, and help people. Yeah, so for very commercial reasons, uh, doing great work in the world um, works for the business as well. It's a very powerful brand building strategy. It creates a very uh, engaging culture uh, for people to work in. Um, it uh, it kind of you know galvanizes partnerships very quickly. So there are commercial reasons to be doing really great work in the world. Um, and then beyond that, you know, I really genuinely feel that. Um, you know, there comes a time where you realize that you're actually in partnership with society and you're in partnership with the yep. planet. Yep. And unless you actually have a functioning society and a functioning planet, uh, it's really hard to run a business. <laughs> <You Yeah. know? laughs> yeah. Just, just, just go to some really messed up places in the world and try yeah. and start a business there and, and you'll see pretty quickly uh, why it doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's a fantastic point. I like that. That's certainly more important than uh, getting your website mobile responsive. Um, one of the kind of, cause there's so many areas that we could talk about and I want to try and narrow this down for our audience of funnel builders, guys who build marketing funnels. A lot of us are traditionally in 
a service-based mindset and a service yep. market. I'm trying to help them kind of expand out and productize and, and leverage more of their life. But a big part of how I think I was able to do it was through the, the framework of key, key person of influence. How if you're at the center of everything and you can begin to leverage people around you, it's um, it, it, your life is easier. You can make you know, a bigger impact, but a lot of funnel builders and service businesses are stuck in the mindset that they can't become that key person of influence or an author or an expert. Where do you start? You know, how do you start that transition into a KPI from a traditional service background? Yeah. So, well, the first thing you do is you acknowledge that you're actually on a mountain of value, but there's this phenomenon called proximity bias and proximity mm -hmm. bias means that whenever you're too close to something, uh, you tend to devalue it um, or your perception of value is altered. Mm -hmm. um, so for some, some things, your perception of value is altered in a positive way. So people tend to overestimate how amazing their kids are um, <laughs> and, uh, and they tend to underestimate how amazing their business is and their story is typically. You know, yeah. some, sometimes it, it, goes, uh, it goes either way. But we have an altered perception when we're clo too close to something. Um, you know, you might have bought a piece of jewelry or like a watch or something. And, you know, when you were wanting it, it was the most amazing, beautiful thing you've ever seen. And then for the first month, it was, you know, something you, you were really proud of. And then over time, you forget, you know, it's just to you, it's just a uh, just a watch. I actually have a friend of mine who bought a 55,000 pound Rolex. Wow. And uh, he wears that as his everyday watch now. Like yeah. he, just literally, he literally wanders around with it. Um, <laughs> And he's forgotten that it's a fifty-five thousand pound uh, watch. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a, this is an example of proximity bias, um, and uh, and and essentially, we do this with ourselves and our careers and our business. So you know, a lot of people they forget. I've you know I've worked on this award-winning project. I've I've done this you know phenomenal work with this particular well-known brand. Um, I did a piece of transformation work that took someone from losing money to making money. Um, you know, someone might have done some work where they, uh, you know, cost per lead went from 17 pounds down to nine pounds. And then that allowed the business to scale. Mm. And, you know, and it's kind of like you're in the world where everyone does that. And you're in the world where lots of people do that. And you're also in the world where uh, maybe 12 people worked on that particular project. So you wouldn't want to take the credit and all, the, all yeah. that stuff, which I, I get it. But, uh, but still don't, don't overlook the value that you're on. So the first step is really just sort of, trying to get present with the mountain of value that you're already standing on, try to dig deep into that mountain and find the stories, the intellectual property, the methods, the case studies, the examples that you've got that are highly valuable. Um, there's a real tendency out there to just become distracted by all the cool shit that everyone else is doing and to kind of lose track of actually you've been doing cool shit as well. Um, yep. so, so that's one of the first things. The next thing is how are you going to pitch that? How are you going to craft that into a story? Yep. Um, how are you going to turn that into you know, a compelling narrative about what it is that you do, who you do that for, um, why it's important in the world? You know, what's the bigger context that makes mm -hmm. it even more important than that? So these are, these are important questions around pitching it. Um, and then extending that into published content. So once you've got a great pitch, how do you then publish that into materials like books and reports and blogs and articles so that people are able to discover that on their own terms and on in their own time and wherever they are in the world? Do you know, the moving from acknowledging the mountain of value into the, the, the published side is a really interesting paradox, particularly for a lot of our businesses. Um, I noticed that I got more speaking jobs and recognition after publishing a book. And yet a lot of people think that expert status is like a badge that's handed to you. And then someone's like, right now go write the book. And it's not, and, and you make that very clear. It's actually yeah. the other way around. It's you can't be seen as yeah. an authority until you're publishing. Right. No, no, no one's like, no one's like talent scouting. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, it. You know, it's, it's kind of like, you know, you're walking around the shopping center and someone says, you know, hey, would you like to be a professional speaker at our event and, yeah, yeah. and share some of your stories? It just doesn't happen that way. You've got to put yourself out there a bit um, for people to discover you. So you've, you've got to make the first move. Um, and the first move is is publishing. Yeah. Uh, the first move, is, and it could be publishing reports, blogs, articles. It could mm -hmm. be publishing a podcast. Um, ultimately, the big game changer is definitely going to be the book. Um, mm -hmm. It's funny. Books are, bo books are really old technology, right? They're... Um, 
you know, in the world of in the world of uh, Internet of Things and AI and machine learning, you think, you know, how valuable is a book? But actually, you know, a book is very hardwired into society that it's the authors who are the authorities. Mm. Yeah, and it, to me, I've always explained it. Even a long form ten thousand word blog post. Uh, only one of two people would write that length one someone who is already an expert and clearly knows what they're talking about or two a crazy person and most people are going to assume that you're an expert because who else would write 10,000 words on you know optimizing a landing page for higher conversions only an yeah. expert would do that right yeah uh, it's also really interesting there's a company called spider.io um, and Spider was seven PhDs uh, from, I think, Oxford, Cambridge or something like that. Mm. And um, they, wrote, they wrote crazy long blogs mm. about what was wrong with Google's algorithms <laughs> and, um, and, and like, like, like insanely long stuff. Anyway, guess who acquired them? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And this is, it's kind of, it's reflective of what you have to say. And often that comes from that initial mountain of value that you're sat on already, right? It's, it's already stuff that you probably know about. Yeah. Yeah, it, it is. And it's, it's never, it's never the new fad. It, like the thing that's going to make you really valuable yeah. is never, it's never like you've, you've had nothing to do with payment systems in the world, but now you're, now you've discovered blockchain. It's like yeah. now, ah, that's the thing. It's like, yeah. it's never that. Yeah, that was it, that was a really interesting point you brought up, and this this again comes up a few times. It's almost as if the actual I've got to be careful with how I word it. The niche itself isn't as important as your commitment to serving that niche. It's not like there's going to be a magic gold vein somewhere can, that has all. Well, I can tell you, I can tell you the the uh, it's the top five percent of every industry or niche that makes all the money. Mm. Um, mm. you know, maybe 10%, but, uh, you know, 10% at a push 5% definitely that's where all the money is. And it really doesn't matter whether your, you know, your niche is, um, audio engineering or your niche is how to, uh, how to do potty training with kids or how to, um, you know, renovate a house. The essentially it doesn't like whatever the niche is, there are, there are only the top five to 10% of people who mm. make serious money out of that niche. So you're not, you know, and when you find niches that have got a lot of money in them, they're highly contended. Yeah. So, you know, like for example, if you want to get into the property development space, you very quickly realize that there's, there's a lot of seriously smart people who are out mm. there contending to be a key person of influence in property development. Mm. So even though, yes, there's a lot of money in property. Yes. It also attracts a lot of people. So, yeah. Um, you know, you can take something that's uh, like, for example, I, I just kind of dropped it in there before you take something like um, sleep training ki children um, or potty training children. I, I actually have clients who that's their niche yep. and they, they have, you know, they're making serious money out of, uh, of parents paying, you know, for their advice and paying yep. for their guidance and coaching them and working with them to get the kids to sleep. Um, yeah. And that's, and, uh, yeah. So, so, and that's, that's then reflected. You mentioned as well is, is getting this pitch and this social pitch, right? And I think mm. in KPI, I think it's like page 80 or something. And I know that because Look I, at you. You, well, you I printed it out like... because I was like the way that these are rewritten from I'm a dentist to, I help people feel confident about their smile. Yeah. It's so important to have this level of, um, clarity about what it is you're bringing to a market and if you try and serve too many people you end up you won't serve any of them and the big reason i think people do that is because they're worried that the niche yeah. they're choosing is too small well it, it's um it goes it goes into the nature of society over the last thousand years that essentially for 950 of the last thousand years it made a lot of sense to be a generalist because we were working with, we were working with geographical limitations. So, you know, if you were to say, Oh, I'm, I'm purely and simply a uh, store focusing on hammers and I only sell hammers and that's the only thing I sell. Yeah. I don't sell anything other than hammers. Well, the problem with that is that you might have a passion for it. You might be the best in the world at it, 
but ultimately it's only going to be people in a five mile radius who can actually get to you and buy from you. Mm. Um, so very quickly you realize that it's smarter to sell hardware. Uh, and then you realize that it's smarter to, you know, do hardware and plants, um, gardens, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, and, 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 because you realize that the more stuff you can sell to people in the local five mile radius, essentially your niche is, is five mile radius. So it makes sense that you do as much for that five mile radius as you possibly can. Um, now, when you go into the world of digital, now you're talking about a potential audience of billions of people. They're looking for who's the best in the world at this thing. Who, you know, who, who helps, who helps men who have a gold frequent flyer um, status on three airlines to lose weight, despite the fact that they are never in the same place more than once. Yeah. Um, you know, the more than a day or two, you know, who, who helps, um, who helps people who have had a skiing accident to run a marathon, you know, within 12 months, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like who's the person for that. And it's kind of like, as soon as you start getting into the world of digital and the world of online, um, then being a generalist essentially puts you into the bland noise yeah. of the marketplace. It doesn't allow you to stand out. So the reason people do it is because that there's just this legacy of, you know, our parents and our grandparents, rightfully so, have basically said, whoa, don't niche, be general because, yeah. you know, otherwise, otherwise you'll be limiting your marketplace because they've yeah. got a geographical mindset. Yeah, and I think a lot of service businesses and funnel builders are still in this mindset. I love the idea of, of you know, understanding the amount of value that you're on and coming up with the pitch. The pitches, I think, is the hardest thing for people to work on because once you've got that, everything else is more sequential because it's easy to publish a book when you know the specific topic that you're on. Is there any, any kind of direction you can give in <laughs> yeah, eight minutes on how people can work on their social, yeah. on their social pitch? Yeah, well, a social pitch really needs to be uh, 20 to 30 seconds. And the format that I like to go with is uh, name, same, claim to fame, aim in a game. Um, so it's a bit of a mouthful, but yep. it's make sure that you get your name in there and the name of your business. What are you the same as? So something just really simple, really basic that I'm, I'm not confused. So even if you said I'm a funnel builder, yep. um, there's a lot of people out there who have no idea what a funnel builder is. Yep. Um, you know, so you might say, um, you know, I'm a digital technology specialist. Hmm. Um, I, I, um, you might say something, just something really nice and simple. I build websites. Yep. I build, you know, I build websites that work on phones and laptops. So, hmm. you know, phones, iPads and laptops. Um, so something that just people kind of like, a, oh, okay, really simple language of the pub. 15 year old would understand what it is that you're talking about. So would a, 50, you know, a 75 year old. So it's kind of like just nice and simple. So name, same, um, and then claim to fame, something that makes you special or different, a niche, something that you're known for, um, and then aim in a game. And the aim is what are you aiming to do in the next 90 days? What you, what's your bigger game in, in the That's next good. couple of years? Yeah, no, I like that a lot. And, and when it's broken down like that, I think people are naturally going to gravitate towards certain things that's 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 fantastic after we've started publishing content then we've got our blog going we've written up the book you even have a framework for how to write a book in the book which was a bit <laughs> a bit meta um it's uh, yeah it's inception yeah it is yeah yeah what what comes after uh pub publishing publishing content so what we want to do is we want to make sure that we uh, have products. Um, there's a there's a kind of a test that I always throw out there, which is uh, tomorrow I'm going to send you a hundred clients, like a hundred of them. Yep. Um, oh, and these nice. are people. These are like these are ready to buy. They're ready to go. They um, credit card is out, uh, and um, and they all want to sign up tomorrow. Mm -hmm. uh, so the the real question is, how do you feel about that? Um, and if there's any feeling whatsoever of like, oh, there's a real overwhelm around that, um, you know, that means my time is, is now going to be taken up. Uh, I'm not going to be able to take a holiday. I'm going to have to work weekends. Um, if there's any of that sort of stuff, then, then the business is not yet productized effectively. Mm -hmm. So what we need to do is make sure that we, that we have productized the business sufficiently so that regardless of where you are or what you're doing or how many clients sign up on any given day, then the business is actually totally able to absorb that. Um, you know, I think so that if, first of all, 
really interesting that I'm almost halfway down the page and it's only now we're talking about products. I think people try to put products right at the top. And in fact, we've yeah. got what, who we are, what we do, who we serve, how yeah. we're promoting that. And then it's about products. Yeah. That's yeah, fascinating sure. to me. Um, and secondly, it seems like therefore the, the results we want to bring a client such as, you know, increasing their revenue, increasing their leads aren't necessarily always tied to the same way that we've been delivering it then if you're suggesting we can productize and move into other areas yeah so productization is about really getting clear about the outcome what is the client buying mm. um clients clients are never buying your time never um yep. you know if you think they're buying your time try and charge them to play a game of chess or um, <laughs> or to, you know or to you know, to bake a cake together. They're not going to, they're not interested in that. They're, yeah. they're buying some sort of an outcome. There is some outcome that they want to buy. Um, so people who are good at productization, they mm. get very clear about that outcome and they do whatever it takes that would help facilitate the outcome. So sometimes what would facilitate the outcome would be some training. Sometimes what facilitate the outcome would be some online resources, sometimes mm. some actual done for you services. Um, but all of these things can be packaged up. And the other thing too, is just simply because there, there may actually be some time that's involved, but it may not necessarily need to be your time. Yep. So, you know, there's nothing there that says that because someone needs a page designed, it has to be you who designs it. It could actually be that you have a team of great designers who know your methodology. Um, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. So, yeah, so so um, that's that's important as well. And that was something about kind of at the start when we were talking about key person of influence. It's not necessarily a key person of influence in your market as well. It's also within your own business, right? About leveraging out what it is you know and, and getting other people to to help you grow that mission. Yeah, I really want to encourage people to have a team of you know two or three people around them at least. Yeah. Um, where where life gets really fun okay so so a typical journey is that you're good at doing something and you're working in somebody else's company and you're part of somebody else's team and then you think this guy's a jerk and uh, i could do it way smarter he's you know this guy's never in the office and he's not doing much and you know or he's making mistakes that i wouldn't make so i'm just going to go off and start my own business and the very typical thing that people do is they go off on their own by themselves Mm -hmm. And sure enough, initially, the first two years are, are bliss, right? You're sitting there going, wow, I'm, I'm actually, if you're smart, you're going, you know, I used to get paid 45,000 pounds a year at work. Mm -hmm. uh, and now I'm making 55,000 pounds, you know, working from home yeah. and um, I'm not commuting and I'm spending a bit of time with my kids. And, um, you know, I've got my, my regular six clients and I look after them and, and, uh, yeah. and you know, life's good, right? And, um, and then what happens is you hit a point very, you know, normally two to three year mark where you say, Whoa, wait a second. If I want to take a holiday, yeah. um, I really can't take a holiday uh, because it won't cost me five grand to go on holiday. It cost me 15 grand. Yeah. Um, yeah. you know, I'm going to lose this particular client or you do go on a holiday and you can't switch off. Um, you know, so you, your friends are, you know, your family's out there on, on the water skis and you're sitting in the hotel room, you know, with the laptop. Yep. Um, you know, so, so that, that sort of stuff, you know, happens as well. Um, and actually you get into this, oh, you know, it's all on me, the time, time for money trap. And really the way that this is broken, this is an age old problem. That's really easy to solve is that you've got to have a small team. Yep. You've got to have, you know, there's, there's, there's an industrial revolution concept uh, called division of labor and division of labor is the very first productivity hack that we really invented as a society, which was essentially that if you get one person to try and build a car from scratch, mm. it's incredibly hard and takes them an enormous amount of time. And they have to be an insanely skilled person in order to build a car from the ground up. Mm -hmm. But if you, if you organize that into a production line mm -hmm. and you give people just little jobs within that, um, then you can build cars way faster yeah, and yeah. you don't need people to be so skilled. Yeah. So this, this tends to kick in at about three or four people. At about three or four people, you get the beginnings of the productivity uplift of division of labor. Yep. And what that typically looks like is you've got someone who's a key person of influence. They're known, liked, and trusted in their industry. They speak at conferences. They release a book. Um, they win the business. They're the first point of contact with a major client, perhaps. Um, yep. They put together partnerships and relationships. Supporting them is someone in sales or sales business development. 
Um, supporting them also is someone who has a great technical skill, technical development skill. Yep. And then somewhere in the middle, you've probably got someone who's an admin, a PA, mm-hmm. a, a bookkeeper. Yep. Um, and essentially that little team of three and a half people, mm. uh, you get a productivity uplift because there's one person whose only job is just go out and win business. And there's yep. another person whose only job is just totally delight the client. Um, and all four of those people will actually earn more working under one umbrella mm. than if they were all out there trying to do, you know, build the car themselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Man, that's like, if anyone wants to slow that down and, and basically that's your, your team hiring process right there. Absolutely outstanding. Um, I want to make sure that we can wrap this up because I want to be respectful of your time. Uh, after um, productization, is there, a, is there a final step that people need to kind of bring? Yeah, so, so the, the two things that really work after productization is uh, profile building. Yep. So actually making sure that you've got a profile in your industry. Yep. Really, that means that you're known, like, trusted, and credible. Um, so, uh, so profile is that... You know, I don't think that it's wise to try and be famous or to try and be in the spotlight. The goal is not to be in the spotlight. The goal is to become a spotlight for something. It's to be the nice. person who's putting putting a spotlight onto things. No one likes the person who wants to be famous, who wants to be, you know, who wants attention, right? Um, we, we Attention seeking behavior is is pretty disgusting in all its forms, but when you're the types of person who wants to put attention onto something that mm. you're sitting there saying more people should know about this, more yeah, people good. should get involved in that. You know, that's the type of profile you want. You want the profile where you're not saying, look at me, you're saying, look at that. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, and you want to be rather than focusing on how many people can I reach? It's like, how deeply can I reach people? So, yep. um, you know, if you had, if you had 500 people who would listen to 15 hours of your stuff, you know, and, and there's no one else out there, but there's these 500 that would probably give you a phenomenal business for years to come. Mm. Um, and if you had 50,000 people who, you know, who saw you for, for five minutes, that would probably do nothing. Yeah. Um, so you're far better off getting, uh, you know, getting organized around deeply connecting with a small group of people rather than, you know, superficially connecting with a large group of people. Um, the, the final part is to create partnerships. So yes. go find the pieces of the puzzle, reverse engineer a vision, create a vision in the world. What do you want to see in the world? How do you want it to look when it's done? And then which pieces am I going to own? Which pieces do I need to partner? So maybe one of the pieces is, you know, you sit there and say, well, you know, this business really needs a list of a hundred thousand people on email. Well, I don't have that list. So somebody must have it. I need to go partner with the person who has a hundred thousand people on email. Or you might say this particular product, it really needs a piece of software. And the good news is I don't have to create it because it already exists. Yeah. So I'm going to go and find the software owner and see if I can just package that into this piece of software, uh, into this overall product. Um, so it's about finding great partnerships that essentially fill in the, pu- the blank pieces of the puzzle of the vision that you're trying to create. And that's easier than ever now. Again, with the internet, there's like, groups just for people who are so specific within their niche that if they are going to help you in your business wouldn't you know it they're available for free to talk to it's just insane that you know people don't capitalize on on these this building partnership opportunities yeah yeah Um, it's it's, uh it's easy yeah uh so uh daniel let's we'll wrap this up uh just a really quick recap if we want to, if we're in the service business and we want to transition into this, this key person of influence and start leveraging our time better, becoming more free, earning more, um, acknowledge the mountain of value, pitch uh, and create our social pitch, uh, extend that into published content. Yep. Uh, and then we've got yeah productizing, which is really interesting that it came so far down. I like that a lot. Um, and understand that we have to create a profile and become credible. In our marketplace, shine yep. a spotlight on something. That's a really clear distinction. That, and then finally, search out those partnerships. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And it's it's about sticking to that plan. It's not. I think a lot of people mistake this as like overnight success. When actually, it's it's it requires commitment to get through. It's not difficult, but it's it's also difficult to not do. If that makes sense. Yeah. Exactly. And and when you find the right thing, uh, you you achieve success. But there's also a lot of payoff along the way. So. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I'm in. Uh, you know, I'm, a, I'm in my eighth year since writing the book, Key Person of Influence. You know, we've built a global business. It's um, 
you know, it's it's by most people's standards is a huge success. I'm not Mark Zuckerberg, but it's certainly uh, you know, it's a, certainly a very successful business. It has yeah. a team of 50 people, and uh, you know, and we have thousands of clients all over the world. Um, but all the way through, you know, there's no. It's not that I've arrived at this point. It's yeah. like it's been really fun. It's been fun for eight years. It's been such an exciting journey talking to the right people, getting up to my elbows in different businesses and um, and just just exploring the technologies that come out and, and how that fits within the puzzle that we're building. Mm. You know, all of that stuff has actually been a really great thing. And sometimes I think we get too hung up on the idea that success is going to happen at some point yeah. rather, than, rather than just saying, actually, I'm having a successful journey. I'm having a great journey at the moment and I'm enjoying the journey. Mm. Like, it, like a successful holiday is not the getting back on the plane to come home that you've now had a successful holiday. It's, yeah, it's enjoying yeah, the whole yeah, holiday, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah, no, that's good. I like that a lot. A, a wonderful note to finish on. Uh, Daniel, how can people reach out to you? Um, so, yeah, obviously all the right places, all the normal places, Twitter at, at Daniel Priestley, Instagram at Daniel Priestley. If people want to grab the, the books that I've written, um, yeah. so there's four books in the series. Uh, there's... Entrepreneur Revolution, and actually, I've just released the new version of Entrepreneur yeah, Revolution. I saw one it. Here. Yeah, yeah. This one's this one's the old version of Entrepreneur Revolution. That's the new version. Yeah. And actually, there's a lot more. <laughs> yeah. A lot more That's in the insane. new version. The the, the, the new version is about twice the thickness of. Uh, Are you going to redo the the, uh, the audio book as well? I, I probably am because um, it's not me who read the first audio book and people hate that. Uh, <laughs> so I'm going to, I'm going to get in the studio and, and, and do yeah. it. Um, and then there's key person of influence oversubscribed mm-hmm. and then 24 assets. And, yep. um, and basically they go in that particular order. Um, so you can check out that series. It's the Harry Potter of uh, <laughs> Harry Potter series of entrepreneurship. I like that. Um, and then, uh, and then, so one of the other fun things that I've done is created a scorecard for people. The five things we talked about on this call. Yeah. Um, there's a, there's a scorecard where you just answer a bunch of questions. You score yourself as to how you're doing in those five areas. And then it gives you customized feedback as to how to improve. Um, awesome. Link that below. Yeah. Cool. Excellent. Oh, thank you so much for coming on. It's been an absolute pleasure, Daniel. And uh, yeah, I'll get, let you go on with the rest of your day. Excellent. Cheers, mate. Thanks very much. Bye now. Bye now. How fantastic was that? Um, I could have spoken to Dan, uh, Daniel for ages, just on and on and on. Um, I even kind of jumped in and was like, hey, we're doing a video call. He was like, um, all right, okay. <laughs> um, I think to me, the biggest part of that was partnerships. I kind of wish I had a bit more time to, to go over that a bit more. For those who haven't read Key Person of Influence, I highly suggest getting it. It's quite a short book. It's not difficult to consume, but the way it goes through the steps of how to position yourself as an authority within your marketplace, no matter what you do, even as a service provider, even as a funnel builder, it's well worth the effort. Uh, yeah, this was Mike from Sell Your Service interviewing Daniel Priestley, and I will speak to you guys some other time. Thanks very much. Bye now.